I'm often asked, how did a man come to do this work? The real short story is uh, my background is in sales. I'm a sales guy. I'm a sales manager, uh, Procter & Gamble and Coca-Cola. And almost 20 years ago, uh, I was working in sales training when I was asked to lead a diversity education initiative at the Coca-Cola company. And uh, I'm a straight white guy. And I really wondered why I was chosen to lead this work. Uh, but it was an assignment that I took. Uh, and was absolutely shocked uh, that I would learn every day. And I didn't quite understand the concepts. And so it was really the start of my journey. And over the next 10 years at the Coca-Cola company, I would have what they call a white male epiphany, where you realize what white male privilege is and the world revolves around us. And then 10 years ago, I launched this company called Why Women, because what I have come to believe very passionately, and, and my work focuses primarily on corporate America, but if men are still 75 to 80% of senior leadership in most companies and organizations, well, then we could actually be 75 to 80% of the problem in advancing women, but we could also be 75 to 80% of the solution. Simply put, we will never drive long-term systemic engagement an advancement for women without active male engagement. And so that's the work that I, that I do today. And so uh, I've got a few slides that I'm gonna share with you, uh, realizing that data on this work is important. I realize that we may have more women on this call than men. What I would do is ask you to invite men into this conversation. I spend my days talking to men who want to get better. And my belief is uh, 40 to 50% of men actually want to help and support women. They don't know what to do. And, and if we can get 40 to 50% to be really active vocal advocates, then we can certainly get the other men engaged. And so I'm going to uh, get started and just uh, share some, some key information as we talk about this notion of choosing to challenge. And, and it really, it's, it's about advancing this agenda forward. Um, you were sent some pre-work, and this is something that you can take back to your organizations. Uh, it's free on my website. But what we want to do is shift the context. You were asked to take an assessment, and I'm not going to have you share your results, but I want to debrief it for you very quickly. There were 10 questions that asked how you think about gender equity, and then 10 questions around the actions that you take. And so the important part of this is not where you ended up in the continuum, that's for your self-education. But what we find is most men and most women actually think about gender equity much more so than actually taking action. And so this program will be focused on the actions that men and women can take as well as organizations can take to move this agenda forward. So don't get hung up on where you actually scored. Just think about at the end of this presentation, what is one more action you can do to visibly and vocally demonstrate that you are committed to advancing women? As I work with senior leadership teams, one of the questions I always ask them uh, is, what are the biggest challenges facing your organization today? And so that's what we're going to go on. And we're going to focus on three. I'm going to spend just a minute talking about the impact of COVID and the long-term effects it's having on our workforce and our businesses. I'm going to talk about intersectionality for just a moment. And then I'm going to close out with the barriers and the solutions for advancing women. So let's just jump into this. If you were able to attend on Monday, you, you heard a lot of data around what's going on around COVID and the significant impact that it's having. These are U.S. numbers, but the numbers on a percentage basis are very similar to those in Scotland and, and, and the United Kingdom, Great Britain as a whole. Uh, but this is what we've seen. Uh, almost 5 million job losses in the U.S., but women are being significantly impacted more than men and they're not bouncing back as quickly. Additionally, if you think about the roles that women tend to be in, such as service providers, healthcare, education, food service, 
Um, again, these are roles where they may be on the front lines, actually risking their lives to a much greater degree. A third phenomenon that, that's being talked about is this working from home. And women are just reaching a breaking point. And women have always done what we would call a double-double. And that is they worked a 40-hour week at work or more. And then they would come home to another 40-hour week at home. What we have found in COVID is that this is now being called a triple-double with women working almost 70 additional hours in addition to their full-time jobs. One of the few positives of COVID is that we have actually seen men stepping up uh, much more so at home. However, it's still not to the degree that we're seeing women step up. And this is resulting in just their mental wellness. A year into this, women are actually at a breaking point. And one in four is actually considering leaving the workforce or shifting down to a less demanding job. And then you can start to think about this from a long-term standpoint, your talent base, your future leaders are going to be left behind. The last element is we cannot homogenize this experience. We have to talk to individuals uniquely about what's going on in their lives. So that's one aspect of intersectionality. The second aspect of intersectionality is really a contemporary view. We've been talking about diversity and inclusion for many years, but now we're starting to talk about intersectionality and really being all dimensions of diversity, being important and interconnected. And so even though I'm gonna primarily talk about gender today, we need to understand that all of these primary dimensions such as age, or gender identity, or ethnicity, or race, sexual orientation, are equally important as are secondary and organizational and cultural. So this notion of leveraging intersectionality and appreciating all these differences is critically important. You're also going to hear me use a term called women of color, and that tends to be, kind of be a U.S. word. But for our presentation, I want you to think about um, literally anyone other than a white woman. And we're going to talk about the importance of intersectionality and women of color, because every statistic I'm going to provide you is significantly more challenging for women of color. And for, and, and for you know, Scotland, that might be women from Africa, that might be uh, women from the Middle East or Asia, or really any underrepresented group that is in your organization. Uh, or business. So COVID intersectionality and then the really long-term impact of what these barriers are. And so there's really a number of barriers that are impacting women. And I'm going to choose to just focus on five. This information comes from the McKinsey Women in the Workforce Study. And this is a study of 350 of the largest multinational companies in the world. So this isn't just US data. This is very statistically valid data and organizations are looking at this and the numbers are overwhelming. And I would actually encourage you to download this report. It's 80 pages and just go through it and look at all of the systemic issues that are combining to just make it seem harder for women to move ahead in organizations. And so the first one we see is that women receive less support from their managers. What does that look like? Well, they're, they're given um, uh, less tools to succeed. Um, their managers don't necessarily help them navigate uh, corporate politics uh, or create opportunities to showplace their work. What we see is men often get more support from their managers. There's an interesting phenomenon called the broken rung. And what we're finding, and again, this is a McKinsey report that says women are left behind from the very first promotion. For every 100 men promoted in their first job, only 85 women are promoted and only 65 women of color are promoted. So this simple concept of does this really happen? Yes, it happens. And it's very validated. 
Women also get less access to senior leaders. When asked a question, I have never had an informal interaction with a senior leader. 40% of men said yes, they, that they hadn't. 50% of women and 60% of women of color. And we know this is critical because exposure to senior leadership can lead to sponsorship or mentorship. And people with sponsors are 14 times more likely to interact with senior leaders. So this aspect of mentoring and sponsoring is again, one of the aspects that organizations need to get better at. Women also face more everyday discrimination. And this falls into what, again, seems like, you know, fairly benign things, but when it's happening on a consistent basis, it conspires to really make it very hard to advance for women. Um, the number one uh, uh, issue is their expertise or judgment is questioned. And, and this is really fascinating. I actually work with a pharma company that has done work on this. And as they do clinical trials and everything is computerized, what they found is their female scientists' uh, research was actually double checked more than the men's. And so this constant double checking and, and really having their expertise judged is a huge issue. Um, women are often addressed in a less than professional manner and men will even make demeaning remarks about them or people like them with them present in the room. And so this everyday discrimination is real. This leads to another concept called micro inequities. Micro inequities are the little things that women experience every day. We call it death by a thousand paper cuts. Microaggressions are real and 64% of women experience them on a daily basis. The most common one of these is men interrupting women. And when we were working live, this was a very easy phenomenon to see. You would just see women cut off or, or ignored in a meeting. And if you don't believe me, go talk to some women and ask them. Um, what we're seeing in this age of Zoom meetings is now we have a device called a camera that when someone else starts talking, the camera immediately goes to them. And so one of the things as I work with corporate clients is something as simple as having you raise your hand before you're allowed to talk. And this simple thing prohibits women from getting cut off in the middle of their presentation. Plus, women are often mistaken for someone at a lower level than themselves. They may be the most senior women in the room and they're rarely treated like that. And then the last one is women are often expected to do more office housework, setting meetings, getting lunch, things like that. So microaggressions are a reality. And then the last major issue is women are often the only one in the room. And, and what that says is just what it sounds like. Uh, in most meetings in, in business, um, being the only is still very common. 20% of women report this to be true, 45% of women of color, uh, and 75% of LGBT, LGBTQ women. And so uh, if you're the only one there's also a dynamic of a higher percentage of microaggressions taking place. And you are forced to cover, to blend in to the majority. And what covering means is basically you can't bring your whole self to work. And so this notion of covering really comes back and impacts on profit, uh, productivity. Here's the last one. And it's really, again, around this notion of women of color are actually having a much more challenging experience. And again, this comes from the McKinsey report. Men and women, white women, who said they were advocates, 60 and six, 61 and 65% respectively, said they were advocates for women. Yet, as you can see from this chart, they don't take any action, such as actively listening to personal stories publicly acknowledging and giving credit for their work, confronting discrimination, taking a public stand. 
And so the numbers just continue to dwindle. And, and the most powerful number, I think, is at the bottom. And that is only 8% of men and only 12% of white women choose to mentor or sponsor a woman of color. And so if there's one simple action that everyone can do, it's go out and mentor a, a, a woman of color. And what you're going to find is you're going to learn more from her than she is going to learn from you. You're going to hear about her experiences. You're going to hear about microaggressions in a firsthand manner. And that's going to give you the courage to take more action. So these are just some of the workplace barriers that we see taking place. I now want to close out with this notion of, so what gets in the way of advocacy? What are the actions for advocacy? And so to do that, and these primarily refer to engaging men. As I do my work with men, I find that there are about four major themes to what prohibits them from being active advocates. The first one is a lack of empathy. You know, I see the data, but I really don't know that men and women are having that much of a different experience. So many men lack empathy. Apathy, what's the big deal? I don't understand the business case for this. Uh, quite frankly, my boss never talks about it. So I don't understand what the big deal is. Accountability, again, if it's not important to my company, if my senior leaders never talk about it, if it doesn't impact me personally and my boss isn't asking me about it, why should I care? And then the last one is fear. Men are scared to death that they may say or do the wrong thing. And so it's very easy for men, white men, to choose to do nothing. We can have very long, fruitful careers uh, and, and just even avoid this concept of diversity and inclusion and intersection, intersectionality. So how do we overcome fear? So here are the four solutions and, and what they look like if we're in fact doing those. So the first one, how do we overcome a lack of empathy? I ask men to do a simple thing. Listen, invite a female colleague to a virtual coffee and ask a simple question. Are you having a different experience in the workplace than I am? And you know, when uh, Jill uh, says, no, 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 everything's the same, ask again. Because what you have to realize is Jill does not want to represent all of the women in the workplace. Ask again. And she may start to give you some bits of information. Don't interrupt her. Don't say, hey, you know, we got a program for that. Just listen. And then ask a third time. And in that last 10 minutes, you're going to hear root cause issues that you had no idea existed. And this is how you start to have empathy. Apathy, you need to learn. You need to read things like the McKinsey business case. You have to operationalize the business case and bring it to life. Talk about it often. Conduct staff meetings on gender differences. And then you can lead. And leading looks like asking tough questions. This is really the choosing to challenge part. Uh, you know, I've, I've seen this a number of times where we won't have any women ready to be promoted. And when a senior leader asks, where are your women? They say, you know, we just don't have any. And the senior leader goes, yeah, I get it. Senior leaders need to be pushing on their organization saying, what are you doing to get some ready? Because there's a war for talent going on. In the next five years, baby boomers are going to be out of the workforce. In fact, this year, millennials marked the shift to being the largest percentage of workers in most of Western civilization. And millennials think much differently. And so they're demanding things like diversity and inclusion. And so leaders need to lead. And if you're not a leader, control what you can control. Can you just run a staff meeting? Can you invite 
colleagues into this conversation. Can you take one action, again, to move towards more advocacy? And then the last one is fear. How do men overcome fear in doing this work? And, and what I've found is you just have to have the will. The will I have found in most things comes from a personal connection. Though I'm not saying it's a critical criteria, I have found that to be an advocate for anything, you really need to have that personal connection. And so what I have found in this work, and I use myself as an example, it never dawned on me for the first 20 years of my career that if I wasn't advocating for women, I was hurting my mother, my working mother, my sisters, my spouse, and my daughter. Because if I'm not choosing to confront all of these issues that we talked about, I am actually hurting the women in my life. And so advocacy comes from this personal connection. And so to that end, we have a number of tools that you can download. And it's International Women's History Month with better time to do this. Uh, if you go to my website, I actually have three pledges you can take. Um, there's an advocating for women. There's an advocating for women of color. And there's a father of daughter initiative. And so print this out, put a woman's name on it, someone in your life that's going to remind you to go out and do this work and then sign it and just keep it there as a compass to think about why this work is so important. And oh, by the way, it's built on the listen, learn, lead and have the will principles. The last thing I want to close out is one more tool for advocates. And again, if you go to my website, I've created a, a virtual series called Creating Gender Advocates. And the first module is my free gift to you. So go out and download for free the Women's Leadership Imperative. And you can conduct a staff meeting literally tomorrow. It's a 30-minute video with a 30-minute discussion guide. If you find it helpful to your organization, there are other modules available. But this is one thing you can immediately do to start having more gender conversations in the workplace. And so with that, um, this is my contact information. Please reach out to me on LinkedIn, follow me on Twitter, send me direct uh, communication if, if you want resources or anything else. I've got a bunch of white papers and other things on my website. So please, uh, reach out to me and then also go out and have a conversation. Mm -hmm.